Words from Psalm 19 we heard earlier in the service. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It's such a pleasure to be with you from London, UK. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm speaking to you from St. James's Church, which is right by Piccadilly Circus in central London. Perhaps some of you have been here. Ordinarily, of course, this is a 24 seven kind of place. The lights are on and the traffic is running all day and all night. Right now, or perhaps at the time of this conference, we're in or will have just have come out of a third national lockdown to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And so Piccadilly Circus isn't the mass of people it normally would be. It's honestly deserted. I walk around here most days in the parish and I can't help hearing the lamentation. How solitary sits the city that once was full of people. This area is a central business district, the kind of area in many cities across the world that's going through some kind of traumatic reimagining at the moment. Will workers return to the huge offices that are around here? Will the support services and businesses, the coffee shops, dry cleaners and pizza restaurants, will they survive without them? And how long will it be before we welcome tourists back? A predecessor of mine in the early 20th century described this parish as a parish of housekeepers. What he meant was that it was a residential parish, lived in mostly by families who were in service. St James's poor house was in Poland Street, a stone's throw from here in Soho. And the famous song, St James's Infirmary Blues, recorded by Louis Armstrong in 1928, and then subsequently by Janis Joplin, Judy Collins, Eric Clapton, Van Morrison and Tom Jones, is based on an English song about the St James's Infirmary rung by this parish. Perhaps over time, the changing working practices forced by this pandemic will mean a return to a residential central London, and that will have implications for the witness of the church. We're in the middle of huge and enduring challenges, not invented by, but revealed by this pandemic. And for us here, as for you in your different contexts, we're wanting to address these challenges prayerfully, faithfully, imaginatively, as witnesses to the utter beauty and mystery of God's presence in the world and Christ's call into a new, more just and more truthful future. Which brings us to our theme, church as witness. And I'd like to offer you a few reflections about this theme in three ways, spurred on by the astonishingly beautiful Psalm 19, the dramatic gospel of the overturning of the tables in the temple and provocative Paul. The first witness, Psalm 19, gives us our origin, destination and context. The heavens are telling the glory of God. It's with God that we must begin in any discussion of what the church is for or how it is to do it. And context is everything. I've described a city centre ministry here. I look out of the window and I see concrete, tarmac, neon and brick. I see buses and delivery vans. I see people who are cold, cold, sleeping on the street or queuing here on Sundays for a hot breakfast. I also see the carving of a pelican in lime wood, a sky so blue it hurts my eyes. I see the fox making her way down to St James's Park and I watch magpies fighting in the church garden. I see mulberries coming out on the tree in the courtyard, wild strawberries that appear on the unmown lawn and grapes on the vine that intertwines the iron gates right here on Piccadilly itself. Even here in the city centre, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the natural world is forcing its way through the pavement cracks to grow, to turn its face to the sun, to live. Of course, it's easy to get too sentimental about these things. 
but the theological point is crucial. All of creation, seen and unseen, as described in the Apocalypse of Revelation and as in Psalm 19, all creation is calling out, giving voice to its creator, crying, holy, 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 day and night. The context of our life and our witness is as part of this creation in eternity and in time. The theoretical physicist and collaborator with Albert Einstein, John Archibald Wheeler, can help us here. Attributing this thought to some graffiti he says he saw in the men's room of the old Pecan Street Cafe in Austin, Texas. He quotes, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. I would want to take this further as a Christian and say that time is a merciful action of God to help us live because we couldn't, can't handle the reality that life is eternal and love is immortal. Time is God's merciful gift because it stops everything happening at once. The heavens declare the glory of God. When we're caught up in just the street view of our ministry, we've not remembered that our witness is to a reality that's almost too glorious, too astonishing for words. One other observation about this context. It's sometimes said, and I think this has been especially true this year, that trying to understand the world by following the news is like trying to tell the time by looking at the second hand on a clock. It's accurate, sure, but it's exhausting and it won't in the end help you to know what time it is. The church's witness is at its best to read the signs of the times by looking at the hour hand on the clock. No less contemporary, no less now, but moving at a different pace, pointing to a deeper time. For the church's witness to be authentic, understandable and credible, obviously, we need both. Our second witness is the gospel, which gives us the power and danger of imagination. Jesus of Nazareth is a genius storyteller, a playwright really, with those amazing one-act plays he calls parables. And he makes brilliant use of symbolic action. Riding into town on a donkey, grabbing a mustard seed from a nearby tree, writing in the sand as a mob bays for blood around him, and here overturning the tables of money changers who are exploiting the poor. Jesus knew the power of symbols as much as he understood the influence of parables. Like Mahatma Gandhi and the salt marches, like Rosa Parks who sat down, like Pope Francis who prayed both at the Western Wall in Jerusalem but also at the security wall in Bethlehem with all who have ever taken the knee or lifted their hands in prayer or waved a rainbow flag or offered a flower to a soldier, symbolic action matters. For us as Christians, it matters what we do with our bodies because it mattered what God did with God's body in Jesus. The power of action taken to point to a deeper truth runs through the whole imaginative, vivifying ministry of Jesus, poetic teacher, elusive preacher, energetic prophet. The Jesus of the Gospels, perhaps especially in this story, has never struck me as Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus urgent and awkward. In a small way, can the church try to echo this sort of ministry, this sort of imaginative, symbolic action ministry? Here at St. James's, we have tried sometimes to place our own imagination in the service of justice. We salvaged a dinghy from the Aegean Sea in which 67 refugees were found floating. We reinflated it and hung it up in the centre of our church at Christmas, echoing the Orthodox tradition 
that the Holy Family escaped to Egypt in a boat. We filled an oil barrel with ice, suspended the ice over the barrel itself and melted it noisily at the time of the COP climate change conference. It meant that all our Eucharistic prayers were said in the presence of melting ice. We sowed wheat seeds in a huge box in the courtyard last year and grew them over the last lockdown. And this lockdown, in the manner of Jesus's parable, we will sow 42 different kinds, not of wheat, but of weeds that were found in the ruins of this church when it was bombed in the Second World War. We salvaged 700 pieces of clothing from the Greek island of Lesbos and suspended them in the middle of our church, stating in the suspension that the lives of the people to whom they belonged were being wasted, scandalously, stuck in refugee camps all over Europe. The power of symbolic action, if it is imaginative action placed at the service of hope and justice, is clear. It can be emotive, provocative disruptive and good. But it can also be a place to hide from real change and that's its danger. Did it matter that we created a provocative advocacy artwork with a boat from the Aegean Sea? Not really, unless we were also part of being witnesses for our congregation members who were claiming asylum themselves that we were also part of campaigning for unaccompanied child migrants to come to the UK from those same camps. In the Magnificat, Mary teaches us that God scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And from this we learn that imagination is not enough in itself. It has to be placed at the service of justice, the justice that Christ proclaims. Only then, it becomes advocacy and witness. I've often wondered what happened the day after Jesus turned over the tables in the temple. Did they come back? I think they may have done. I think they certainly went back after he died. The integrity that Christ calls us to means that imaginative and symbolic action that provokes debate and highlights injustice is matched by the change making that we find harder to sustain. Christ went to the cross and so his provocative action is always seen with the shadow of the cross falling over it, pointing to a deeper truth and an enduring vision of a more just future. Our third witness is Paul. Paul reminds us that if we're not upside down, we're not the right way up. Perhaps like you, as a leader in the institutional church, as much as I spend time studying scripture, preaching sermons, connecting with people who are afraid or ill or distressed, as much as I pray the liturgy or find new ways to build community, I also spend a lot of time with invoices and spreadsheets, payrolls, job descriptions, juggling hours of work for our staff, balancing budgets. For this physical and now digital space to be a welcoming, prophetic and sustained presence in the city, these bits of infrastructure need attention, of course. And so along with great expertise and dedication from our staff, it requires not a little commitment and understanding from people in my sort of role. And so contrary to Paul's encouragement to the Corinthians, I've been working very hard this past year not to be too foolish. In March 2020, overnight, St James's lost 84.7% of our income, normally just over £1 million a year. Jobs were suddenly at risk, tenants started defaulting, all events were shut down of course, our reserves started reducing, we had to act swiftly. Everything that had seemed solid, the day-to-day -day routines, activities and people all suddenly disappeared. I had to have a crash course in live streaming, which I'd never done before and from March last year did every day. Ever since then, you could say 
that foolishness has been something we've been working hard to avoid, honestly. So aware are we of the livelihoods and well-being of so many people caught up in this place. Cutting pay, furlough schemes, letting staff go, shutting down one business altogether, entering redundancy consultations, all familiar enough territory for charities and businesses in this time. We're in this too. But we preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. One thing I've learned and still learning in this time is that my heart becomes more resilient and more faithful if I am practicing foolishness. And I've noticed it in others too. Not irresponsibility or thoughtless risk-taking with someone else's future, but foolishness. The practice of foolishness deepens trust in God and in one another because it, it means you're admitting that honestly it's not altogether clear what you should do next. Trust is all we have when what we relied on before has gone. For us, this is taking the form of resisting the temptation to preserve for its own sake, trying to loosen our grip on what we thought was important before, holding a huge consultation exercise about our values and taking ourselves into new areas of work and mission, praying for a spirit of faithful adventure, of trustful foolishness, while of course still taking the spreadsheets as seriously as we must. How can the church witness then in these days by remembering its eternal origin and destination, bearing witness that time itself is a merciful gift from God. By placing its imagination at the service of justice for the earth and for all its people, bearing witness to the hope of a new future proclaimed by the holy rage of Christ. By praying to become more foolish, bearing witness to Christ's apostolic community of both celebration and forgiveness, often disregarded by the values of the world. Remembering, imagining, praying together. These scriptures have the potential to save us from current dangers, reducing spirituality to a collection of warm feelings, for example, or allowing the institutional drag of money and buildings to suffocate our energy, vocation and mission. In these pandemic and divided days, if anywhere there is a place to talk about sickness, to face death, fear and injustice in a way that bears witness to the possibility of healing, then it can be in the public sacred space of the church. Because as one UK theologian has so helpfully put it, scripture is not in itself countercultural, but daily encounter with it will make us so. Amen. <laughs>